So uh, let's get started. I care a lot about data and how we can use it and learn from it. When we think of data, we tend to think of numbers and spreadsheets. And we all know about the ginormous amount of data in the world. <coughs> and it's soon going to be added to as our homes become smarter and all kinds of devices chime in. We usually try to deal with this by visualizing it in charts. But as the amount of data and the interrelationships among the data becomes more complex, visualizations become hard to follow. This is showing uh, uh, lifespan and fertility across the world over 50 years. It's hard to appreciate this without spending some real mental effort on it. So thinking about the problem of visualization, I realized that not only data scientists, but actually artists have been in the business of visualization for a long time, and some of their art even uh, responds to uh, parameters of the world around them, changing parameters like this, uh, the noodle, also known as the wind arc, um, that Gary Bates uh, created at Montana State University. Another example is an installation I saw recently at the Missoula Art Museum by another Montana artist, Patrick Zentz. The three musical instruments he created are connected to wind sensors on the roof of the building, and so a visitor deep within can get some kind of a feeling for what's going on outside. Uh, actually, data art as a genre is no longer so rare in museums and public installations around the world. This glass wall in London uh, displays uh, shadow patterns reflecting wind movement uh, outside, again wind, and this display in the San Jose International Airport shows weather by its shimmering and shifting patterns. In these examples, there are different kinds of connections between the subject or the phenomenon that's being sensed and the object or the art object uh, that is representing it. What I find exciting here is that uh, the programmable connection represents a tremendous increase in flexibility, a real opportunity for artists and for people who deal with data that may not need a precise numerical representation. So what kind of data are we talking about? We'll input data from personal or environmental sensors. The so-called Internet of Things is expanding extremely rapidly. There's certainly no lack of material. The output could be an image, a sculpture, even an architectural feature like window tinting. What happens when input and output are connected by software and the internet? Well, software becomes the artistic medium and the internet provides an infinite reach. Software embodies human thought. It can be boring or exciting. It all depends on who writes it. How do we know what makes a good input-output connection, a good representation? Well, some adjectives that might describe it are ones I've listed here. I suggest that any of these could apply to a software representation as well as to more familiar kinds of art. Well, getting back to wind, a favorite visualization of mine is on the web called Earth Wind Map. This is showing wind in the western US. Bozeman is actually a little bit to the right of center there. This was taken a few days ago. Uh, it's often open on my browser and I observe the changes from time to time. I find it to be representative and natural, readable and clear, and surprisingly beautiful. I recently discovered a visualization called Bloom, which represents movements on the Hayward Fault in California. It feels surprisingly calm and benign for something with major earthquake potential. Bloom gives me a sense of connection to the beating earth. It also gave me a wrench in the gut when I first saw it. That is because my home, while a graduate student in Berkeley, on the top floor of that wood frame house, was located directly over the Hayward Fault. And that's where I experienced my first earthquakes, uh, which I perversely enjoyed, those intense moments. Uh, I rediscovered them in Japan, and when I look at Bloom, it reminds me of those places I've lived. The idea of a background visualization, one that asks only peripheral attention, was described in 1995 under the name of Calm Technology. Mark Weiser and John Seeley Braun make the analogy with driving a car. You don't notice an engine noise most of the time, only when you need to, when it has changed and might indicate a problem. Such peripheral or subliminal awareness can nudge our behavior. This light, sold as an ambient orb, can be connected to show electrical usage by its color, and having one in the home and being aware of it has enabled some people to reduce their power consumption by 40%. Ambient awareness works because we have a choice as to whether to attend to it or not. We don't get overloaded by constantly having to pay attention. I think it's similar to the ambient music of Brian Eno, who 
wrote that he hoped it would accommodate many levels of listening attention without enforcing one in particular. It must be as ignorable as it is interesting. I also believe the power of subliminal awareness is that it allows our intuition, our unconscious, to recognize patterns and over time discover what might not be noticed at first. When we perceive something, we identify it in our conscious mind, but recognizing it draws on the vast experience that has been integrated by the unconscious. Now, I don't suggest that art is always the best way to present information. Sometimes data art is simply enjoyable. But I think, depending on the nature of the data, that can also be a productive way of gaining insight into the phenomenon. In general, I think it's most likely to be helpful for tasks that are vague, very complex, have ambiguous information, and that are not urgent, that you can live with over time. The latest tech trend of the quantified self involving rigorous self-monitoring is usually tied up with counts and charts showing steps taken and miles covered. Programmer and artist Lori Frick found a new sense of herself by looking at that data artistically. You can do the same with her phone app called FrickBits. Besides self-awareness, data art is a means to connect really to virtually anything in the world. Technologist and artist Natalie Jeremy Jenko, an early practitioner of calm technology, has made her career of reimagining our relationship with natural systems. Weiser and Braun point out that calm technology, by relieving us of burdens of pain and attention, always, leaves more time and energy for human interactions. So I hope that in the future, artist programmers or artists with programmers will create many more personal forms of data art that will allow the user to connect what, uh, to what concerns them in the world and actually learn from them. This will require a harder kind of AI, an artistic intelligence.